Hello, this is Taras Pluskin. I'm one of the hatchery managers over at the Noank Aquaculture Cooperative Hatchery in Noank, Connecticut. We primarily produce Chrysostria virginica, the American oyster, though we've also dabbled in the hatchery production of sugar kelp as well. My job primarily is the production of microalgae to help feed the shellfish. Um, and this topic is near and dear to my heart because it is uh, basically the next evolution forward in being able to uh, store microalgal assets long term. And thus, this is uh, about the domestic production of algae paste and how it can be applied to shellfish hatcheries along the East Coast. So uh, it, it's very important for any anyone who's not familiar uh, that we realize the relevance of why we're trying to uh, achieve algae paste in the first place. Um, so we're trying to make algae in general as feed uh, to produce oysters, in this case, uh, Chrysostria virginica. Um, this species is, has been and is acting as one of America's most frontier mariculture products. Um, it has a, a history of being produced in this country um, and it is having kind of a, a revived renaissance right now that, uh, you know, though is being rather interrupted by this COVID-19 situation, um, will surely um, recover in the future. Um, so a brief history um, for the oyster industry in America, I think, is, is necessary for understanding the necessity behind uh, developing algae paste technology. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, we kind of had the, the peak of the old school oyster industry. So this was uh, basically the, um, a fishery, a wild fishery, um, in which the wild oyster reefs situated around the rivers around here along the East Coast, um, these would be supplemented by uh, shell, basically, instead of having a raw bar market, uh, most of the shell would be collected by fishermen and then shucked and canned, and it could be shipped anywhere across the country and providing nutrition in a can. But then all these empty shells would be concentrated at these shucking houses and it would be put back in the water during specific periods of time, usually during the spring spawning period, so that you could have a dependable recruitment of new oysters and a revitalization of these reefs. So it's actually kind of interesting that in the 19th century and in a lot of centuries leading up to that, you had a fishery along the East Coast where the fishermen were actively participating in the recruitment of the animals that they were harvesting. And it was fueling all sorts of addendum industries, such as the canning industry and the distribution industries and, and the restaurant industries and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so it was a multi-million dollar enterprise that involved you know canned oysters getting all the way across the coast um i mean across the continent of the united states um so this uh massive industry was uh largely destroyed um it was starting to be disrupted around the 19th century uh, through pollution in the textile textile mills etc but it was destroyed uh throughout the course of the 20th century uh mainly hurricanes um that came through these destroyed the natural oyster reefs and distributed uh the populations, um, uh, pollution from the textile mills and other industries um, that would arise pre, uh, during, and post wars um, would directly poison and kill the oyster reefs. Um, there would be uh, novel diseases introduced in the 1950s, such as MSX and Dermo. You know, these would wipe out the, the, the native oyster populations because they didn't have resistance to a lot of these diseases. And of course, the old breed of oystermen. Uh, that knew how to re-recruit, um, knew when to dump these shells, knew how to rebuild these reefs, knew how to participate with these wild oyster reefs. Um, they were largely um, wiped out economically due to the hurricanes. Again, their boats were destroyed. Uh, loss of crop due to the pollution also hurt them. The First and Second World Wars hurt them because oyster farmers were disproportionately um, drafted. Many of them were killed out there. Um, so between the economic and um, direct pressure, a lot of the old breed, that old knowledge went away. And then a lot of this environmental pressure as well caused the wild reefs to deteriorate. Um, so for the longest time, the oyster industry in the United States became something of a historical afterthought. Now, this changed around the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, as um, everyone is, is really kind of experiencing now. And that's kind of this raw bar renaissance where the oysters, the canned product is, is much less embraced and even cooked oysters in general is, is kind of odd, at least up north where I'm from. But, but raw oysters is very popular 
very popular and they are they are consumed everywhere and they're basically kind of considered um, uh, a premium addendum uh, product to either a high end meal um, or even um, you know they become something of a staple um, around here for cocktail hours and you know even everyday picnics. Um, so because of this raw bar renaissance, you really have an increased value of the individual shellfish. Um, so instead of having to depend on this big weight of meat and these big boats, you know, even small operators can sell their crop for about 70 cents an oyster, which is extremely high value considering most of that weight that you're selling is, is shell. So this 20, so this, this raw bar renaissance that has kind of occurred has really made oysters extremely relevant again as far as an East Coast mariculture pro product, because they're they're sustainable, they help uh, they help improve the environment um, as they grow. They're not detrimental. Um, obviously, there's a domestic market that's growing, even though it's a little disrupted right now, and that will continue. And then there's great um, potential for lucrative uh, export markets as well. Um, you know, back in the, the you know pre plague, as it were. Um, you know, some oysters could go for, you know, you know, they'll go for four or five bucks a piece, you know, in potentially in New York in a, in a nice restaurant, but in, at a Red Army family dinner table in, in Beijing, they can, they can go for, you know, extremely lucrative prices. But, but the key to this production, the key to um, maximizing the profit and increasing the positive example that this mariculture industry uh, has, um, it's, it's, it's key to have hatcheries uh, because w without this, then all the old issues of the 20th century can and will be repeated um, to probably disastrous consequences. So why are hatcheries so key to sustaining this premium raw bar market? Um, well, there's a few reasons. Um, some are more direct than others. Uh, the first is that, of course, you know, if you have a hatchery and you're making more oyster larvae, you're going to make more oysters. Um, so you're supplementing that production. And um, in areas where there's not replenishing uh, wild populations of oysters, you know, this is very true. Um, you know, when you're in Rhode Island in the, in the salt ponds, for instance, you know, there are no wild uh, oyster populations really recruiting successfully there. So, you know, you really are hatchery raised seed is really the, the majority of that, that, that production. But when we're talking about areas, you know, like where we're farming, you know, the mouths of the Connecticut rivers in like, you know, Connecticut river, Thames river, um, who's tonic, uh, you know, these oyster populations, uh, can spawn and re-recruit in these environments. So the actual production that a hatchery is capable of compared to just an average annual spawn of a fairly robust wild population is minuscule, even if you had dozens of hatcheries. Um, so we're not really talking about scale of production because you know if we, if we talk about that, there's nothing really to compete with the old way of doing things, with giant boats pushing shell in, using the natural spawn to re-recruit. There's no real competition with that natural set as far as numbers. Now, the key here is that you want to have an oyster that is suitable for the raw bar market. You know, you want an oyster that's not just going to be steamed and canned and you're gonna put all this effort into it just to get, you know, a couple cents on the, on the oyster. Um, you wanna have an oyster which can sell for 70 cents wholesale. Um, now, to do this, you need to have a single oyster like the illustration below. Like, you want to have one oyster that's a consistent shell shape and size. You want the, the, the New Yorker sitting at the table or, you know, the person sitting down that paid for this nice meal. They want to have a consistently shaped product every time. They want to have a deep shell um, that has room for lots of meat. They want to have a thick shell that doesn't chip when it gets shucked, so you don't have a bunch of fragments of shell inside the meat of the oyster. Now, to do this uh, requires a hatchery, really, because in a hatchery, you take an oyster larvae, and when the oyster larvae conducts metamorphosis, um, in the wild, you know, multiple larvae can sit on a bunch of different sets of a bunch of different substrates. You can have like twelve oysters settling on the same oyster shell, or on the same tire or on the same log. So they'll become all these different jaunty shapes and sizes that really aren't conducive to a proper shaped oyster for the raw bar market. 
Now in the hatchery, um, a larvae can be attached to a single um, shell fragment. So only one larvae will be able to fit on that one piece of shell fragment. So when they grow out, um, you'll basically have individual oysters like the ones you see below. So those can just grow out independently and they won't be fused together um, from birth as it were. So that's, that's extremely important. So the hatchery product itself is of a substantially higher value, though uh, per oyster larvae, the investment is considerably higher as far as capital. Um, considerably. Um, so the other indirect benefits of the hatchery um, that are very important is that selective breeding is paramount. So like I said, there have been disease outbreaks that have occurred in the past. Um, these were completely devastating. We now have selectively raised lines that are resistant to a lot of these diseases, but they need to be um, improved upon and sustained. So to do that, you need to be able to control your genetics and operating a hatchery is paramount to that. Now, there are other considerations, such as increased growth and meat quality, though uh, really those are much secondary to disease resistance. Um, we are waiting for new novel diseases to pop up that will eradicate the growingly uh, homologous uh, stock that oyster farmers have. And, and that's my last point. Um, to have more oyster hatcheries across these coasts is not only good for sustaining this industry and fortifying it, you really need, need to localize the genetics of your oyster populations. It's okay to improve them, to make them more disease resistant, um, but it is paramount that you do not make all the populations the same. I see a, a growing amount of farmers in Rhode Island and even in Connecticut um, purchasing their seed from out of state, even as far north as Maine. And, you know, you see a, a, a small amount of successful hatcheries representing a larger amount of the oyster genetics that are being expressed in more states. And this is extremely dangerous to the, the whole disease resistance aspect. So I think we need to be able to maintain as much localized genetics and maintain the assets of those genetics as possible. And hatcheries are really important to do that. Um, so for all these reasons, hatcheries are important. So why don't we have a bunch of hatcheries? And the reason for that is that they're extremely expensive, um, they're difficult, and we don't have a lot of uh, cultural precedent for them. We're not like Asia. We didn't have a blue revolution in the 1960s. Um, so we're kind of just getting around to it now. So as far as hatcheries go, there's much room for more expansion, uh, both as far as numbers and in localities. So there should be an oyster hatcheries all across Florida, for instance, um, all the way up in every single state going towards Maine. There, through no other mechanism can the genetics be truly um, reservoired in such a way that, that we can really keep this industry expanding and fortified in case of new calamity. Um, so the big bottleneck for hatcheries, why are they so expensive? Well, um, that's algae, in a word. So microalgae, live microalgae, is the accepted gold standard in the shellfish hatchery. Basically, that has been what has been demonstrated to be most effective since the days of Victor Lusinoff at the Noah Milford lab first closed the life cycle of a bunch of these shellfish species in the first place. Um, so these algae species are not wild. They are domesticated species, uh, ones used for aquaculture um, that have been extracted from across the world and have been libraried and banked in uh, a series of laboratories, one of which is the Milford Laboratory um, and also the Bigelow Lab up in Maine. Um, so basically, uh, when you're selecting shellfish species, uh, you're looking for two things. Uh, one is you're looking for usually small-sized uh, organisms um, because you're going to want to be feeding uh, oyster larvae. So anything within the usually something is going to be within six to six to 12 microns in size. Um, some of them will be a little bit bigger, but those can't be fed to early larvae. But the most important consideration of, uh, that live microalgae has and for selecting these species is that they're high in, in PUFAs. So they're high in polyunsaturated fatty acids. Uh, so these are the, the, the long chain, high energy uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Um, that are so important for us in, in krill and in, in salmon oil 
uh, for instance, and uh, algae synthesize them. So most microalgae used in the shellfish hatchery uh, are small and they contain high concentrations of these polyunsaturated fatty acids. And then, and then the green ones also contain this, these 24 methyl sterols, which are very important for, for successful metamorphosis as well. So one of the benefits of algae is uh, that they are very modal and viable when you put them in the enclosure to feed your shellfish. They don't die immediately. They'll probably live. Um, a lot of these species are very robust. Um, and they'll swim around until they are consumed. Um, they won't just sink to the bottom. They'll, they'll try and keep themselves buoyant through various mechanisms. And they have a high level of nutritional integrity when they're alive, too. If they're not dying and they're not decomposing and they're keeping um, all their nutritional contents um, stabilized as well as their uh, homeostasis. And then, of course, when you're feeding live algae, there's also possible probiotic and pro-enzymatic uh, benefits that the oysters are getting for, especially larval oysters, for building their their immune system and developing. You know, they're getting those probiotic benefits that haven't been well described, and they're also perhaps signaling benefits. Um, these are largely anecdotal, but such as adding pavlova um, into uh, uh, adding pavlova into uh, metamorphosis tanks to induce metamorphosis. Um, there's uh, perhaps an association there. Um, so live microalgae is a gold standard for various reasons, and that's why it's you know relied upon by researchers, farmers, and in nature everywhere. And, and some species of note here um, are the ones that are most often used. You know, you have uh, some naked flagellate species here, the T. isochrysis galbana from Tahiti, um, isochrysis latia, and then you have Pavlova lutheri, pinguis, and then you have some diatoms, Catastrus mulleri, Catastrus neogracilae. Um, Thalassoria west flogi, Thalassoria pseudonona, and then Tetraselmus striata, some chlorophytes, Tetraselmus chui. Um, so all of these have really robust fatty acid content, and um, they're the ones that will be constructed into paste as well. So I mentioned before that Expanding hatcheries is limited by the capacity for expanding live microalgal culture at the, at the current standing. So there's a lot of different reasons why live microalgae has inherent limitations. So first off, a lot of these species that we're growing, even though they are somewhat weed-like, you know, they're very robust and, and grow very easily. But some of them, especially the Tiso and the Pavlova, that are very important for contributing the omega-3 fatty acids to early larvae, they're very small and their cultures can be easily contaminated. Uh, you know, by cyanobacteria, by uh, bacteria, other algae, fungi, and there's a variety of things that can contaminate uh, these cultures. And this risk, risk increases exponentially with scale and the concentration of the system. So, you know, the more intensive your system is, the more high your risk is. If you're running a CCAP system that everything's connected, you might lose the entire system with contamination. If you have a couple big tanks, you might lose a lot of investment with a, a contamination. Um, and obviously the bigger your scale is, the more difficult it is to make sure there's not a fly or something that gets in and introduces something that could hurt your, your algae. Um, so there's a lot of inherent requirements here, which have high capital costs. So you have sanitary infrastructure, you know, you have to have a clean waterproof floor, you can have greenhouses, but you know, there's a lot of pros and cons to the infrastructure and, and, and none of it is, you know, the cheaper you go, the more risky it gets. Uh, in Florida, you guys have better options because you have the power of the sun. This is less available to us up north, and as a result, a lot of our infrastructure is inside, and we result on, on more automated, intensive systems than, than large-scale culture tanks. Um, you need skilled labor. You need algae schmucks such as myself that uh, loves to stare at algae all day and loves to grow it in better. You need a lot of electricity costs, unless you have the power of the sun and are able to utilize it very effectively. Uh, you're going to spend a lot of money on temperature regulation and on lighting. Uh, you're going to have water costs unless you're closely proximated to the ocean, in which case you're going to have filtration and pumping costs. Uh, large lot, uh, carbon dioxide is a cost a lot of people don't think of. Um, to keep algae cultures going, at high densities requires a lot of carbon dioxide, and if you don't have a clever, cheap source of that, that can be very expensive. And of course, chemicals, which um, 
comparatively aren't very expensive, but especially the nutrients can add up and are a significant cost that should not be ignored. Um, so algae has to be cultured correctly. You know, you can grow a lot of algae cells heterotrophically without introducing them to light. You can grow a lot of TISO that way, though it's not necessarily going to have the DHA and EPA content that you really want to give to your larvae. You got to think of algae in this case as more as tiny little machines you're trying to get to manufacture exactly what nutrients you want to give to your shellfish. So you have to not only grow algae correctly, uh, but you have to grow it in such a way that it produces what you want, and you have to reconcile that with growing it at a very large scale to make your investment worthwhile. And even if you do everything right, if you have the right algae schmuck, the right facility, the right everything, there's always the Heisenberg principle of uncertainty. And calamity is just one or two shades of unknown away. Um, and that's always uh, a pressing risk in the hatchery. So all these requirements for live microalgae culture constitute a considerable cost for the hatchery. The hatchery itself wouldn't be a terribly expensive operation if it were just raising the oyster larvae. Um, but the fact that you have to grow live microalgae to truly make your facility effective uh, really is a limiting factor. Um, you can see a picture of me there being an algae schmuck uh, swirling my flasks. But this is an, a, a highly general number, but 300 to $600 per kilogram dry weight of algae is about right. When you think of all the electricity that you use, all of the, all of the everything involved, the labor, um, you know, this number can be moved uh, one way or the other by changing your cultural, te cultural technique or how many employees you have. Um, but it's always going to, to constitute a significant cost. Um, that can be upwards of 60% of a hatchery's operations. Uh, budget. Um, but, you know, it's it's food and it's farming. So that is just how it goes. And considering that you don't have to feed the oysters for the rest of their grow out cycle, that more or less that is provided by nature and they just graze uh, natural uh, algae out in the wild. Um, it is a relatively acceptable, it, it is an acceptable investment um, to ensure uh, that the industry is stabilized, but very expensive like live microalgae is, and naturally this has prompted a quest to find alternatives. So there have been numerous efforts to try and replace the cost of producing live microalgae in the oyster hatchery um, to varying degrees of, dis of success. Uh, early on during the Lusinoff days, it was attempted to supplement uh, uh, broodstock with yeast and starch supplements to try and increase their glycogen content. And though this was successful as kind of filler feed for the broodstock, um, it d didn't have anything remotely close to the fatty acid content that you would need for algae or even post set. So really not really effective there. Um, you have a variety of formulated feeds which have come out. I didn't really bother to cite any. I'm not really in love with any of them. But um, this is an attempt to make kind of a, a simulated algal cell, um, basically out of base components and uh, like a sonicator and making these kind of micro encapsules. Um, and again, these are very expensive, um, not really tremendously well uh, effective for larvae. Um, and at the cost, not really worth it. Um, you have lipid, lipid emulsions, which are an interesting attempt. This was done um, and attempted where you took uh, products like Selco, where you had fatty acids um, that you could enrich your algae content with. So this, this argument is that you can kind of double the worth of your microalgae by supplementing them with all these fatty acids, or that you can even grow microalgae of a lesser quality um, or even a, a more weed-like species um, that can be then enriched um, and, and fed. Um, but again, this is expensive to buy these products and you have to add them to live microalgae as well. Um, so frankly, my opinion is that a lot of these alternatives are unacceptable for fundamental reasons, but one of the most um, direct and promising products is taking live microalgae and making this concentrated algae paste, which has been used in various laboratory and production settings, and I do believe has, has, has a role 
um, in, in the perpetuation expansion of more shellfish hatcheries. Uh, when it comes to making algae paste, um, obviously this could be its own project and a half altogether. Um, however, I'll, I'll describe the summaries of at least my personal findings um, and how I chose to kind of craft this project to be a kind of most applicable to what I consider uh, doable in the small scale hatchery, the average one anyway. Um, so the most energy intensive and engineering savvy part of the process is finding a way to separate your algal biomass, all your algae cells from the liquid media that they're grown in. So you're trying to separate them from the majority of the water, turning all uh, basically a high density uh, water culture into an extremely high dense, super saturated paste. Um, now this is difficult because you want to retain cell integrity because you don't want to break these cell walls. You don't want their lipids spewing everywhere and decomposing. You really want to maintain the integrity of as much cell walls as you can. So there's kind of difficulty inherently there. So most methods when it comes to removing algae, if you have a bunch of algae in your fish tank, for instance, you can add a flocculation agent and you can combine all these algae and then all of a sudden they'll sink to the bottom and you have clear water. Um, now this is very effective and relatively cheap. However, these flocculation agents create particles which are way too big or at least undesirable for filter feeders to properly utilize, especially the larvae. Um, so flocculation um, methods are considered not desirable. Um, so as a result, mo the methods that I chose to, to focus on and that most, most people seem to have successes is, is using centrifuges. So by applying um, a, a force um, on the algae culture, um, it is, uh, a, a, you are able to separate the algae cells um, from uh, the water, the majority of the water. So uh, basically what people have been using is, though there's, there's very limited technology that is directly applied towards algae harvesting per se, and what technology does exist is heinously expensive um, and difficult to source. So what most people have done, both in the research and production settings, is use cream separators um, from the dairy industry. Um, so this is a unit that I purchased during my ex early experiments, um, for instance. This is from a, a company from the Ukraine called Slavic Beauty. Um, it costs about 300 clams. And uh, this unit uh, runs about 100 liters per hour. And basically this, this saucer pan you see at the top here, the illustration, um, raw algae culture could be introduced um, into there. Usually I, I kind of put it through a 20 micron sieve in case there was a bug or something or like. Um, and then the, the algae culture would enter and then there would be a, a centrifuge in the center here. And you would have um, basically your water with a little bit of diluted algae uh, coming out these two spigots. Um, which you would collect in a waste container or maybe pass through a second time. And then in the center, you would have this, this chamber, and this chamber would then be lined with the concentrated algae cells, and this could be scraped afterwards, and these cells could be collected. A little bit messy, but um, you know, very, very easily done on the, on the small scale. Um, so as a result, you could take algae cultures, which you know, maybe had you know, tetrasoma species, had three or four million cells per milliliter, and you could turn that to about seven. Uh, about a billion. Um, and you could take, you know, cell cultures which, you know, like Pavlova and Tiaiso, Catastrophe Mulleri that were smaller, that had maybe, you know, six to 10 million cells per milliliter, and those could go upwards of, you know, you could go higher, five, six, seven billion cells per, per milliliter with the paste. And that's after reconstituting. So you can get extremely high concentrations through this um, using these kind of simple units. Now, obviously, in the future, uh, you'll need to get bigger cream separators and then ones which will be more customized um, to be more efficient for algae as opposed to uh, designed for cream. So the nice thing about being able to have this algae paste is that you can take an eight foot tall tank um, full of algae and you can turn it into a 10 inch uh, ice cream container. Uh, full of algae. So you can easily stockpile and store um, large volumes of algae culture uh, in closed uh, spaces. Um, now the key to that is how long can you retain that algae um, and how long will it stay good nutritionally. 
Um, so this is highly variable, obviously, in the, in the cultural practice of the algae, the species of algae, how it's how it's processed, how the paste is constructed. But we'll focus now on just the the, the storage techniques of the algae. Now, there's been a lot of work successfully done with Tetrasalmus species and other chlorophytes. Um, and these have a really big doozy of a cell wall, which means that they can, uh, they can really handle a lot of changes in homeostasis and they can handle very, very low temperatures uh, as well. So there have even been successes freezing these guys and then carefully thawing them and having live cells come back, which is pretty darn cool. Um, most success, however, is keeping them at high concentrations uh, at low temperatures, um, you know, as low as a refriger uh, average refrigerator or even a little bit lower uh, is good. Um, keeping them dark without light for photosynthesis, keeping them unaerated is good. Trying to keep them as dormant as possible is, is key because not only are you trying to keep these animals uh, uh, alive, but you're trying to keep them from metabolizing so they're not attenuating um, their lipid and nutrient reserves and they're not producing metabolites which can harm them and the other algae cells around them. So in general, um, only Tetrasalmus species um, is it appropriate to freeze as of now and you'll only find frozen uh, algae paste products that are composed of Tetrasalmus species as far as I'm concerned. Um, there have been attempts to uh, uh, freeze, dry, and use cryopreservation techniques, though I'm not quite familiar with them, nor do I suspect that they would be cost-effective. However, I think that diatoms would probably be a good applicant for freezing um, products, frozen products that could last uh, longer. Um, there are some Arctic species of diatoms, such as Catastrophe neograculae, which... Um, have been demonstrated that produce anti-freezing proteins and can be frozen solid and ice as far as their natural life cycle. So perhaps that can be taken advantage of for new frozen products. But for, for the most part, we're limited to refrigerated products. Um, and those are going to be the most high value ones that you see on the market. Um, now, these can be available. These can be kept for, you know, homemade ones that I was more or less kind of dirty and constructing. I've had last one or two weeks you know, with kind of some air storage. Um, and then you have some commercial products like uh, Reed Mariculture, Shellfish Diet 100, for instance, and those can last upwards of a year if unopened. Um, so there are obviously some techniques, um, not only for con contamination prevention, because I think that might be a little bit easier than, than maybe thought, because the act of centrifuging um, perhaps probably separates a lot of bacteria from the algae. Um, there have been, there's been some evidence of that, but, um, you know, not, not only that, but there's probably some, so, some different preservation agents, um, many of which have been experimented on with mixed results, but clearly the, the successful commercial enterprises that have consistent products that last over a year have found some, some successful preservation agents for the algae paste, but they're, they're, they're most likely highly proprietary in nature. So there are some special considerations when feeding uh, algae paste. Um, like I said, with live microalgae, you put the algae in there, it's going to stay alive, it's going to stay modal for you, it's going to do all these things um, to keep the show running until it's consumed by the shellfish. It's going to keep its, its nutrition stable, it's going to stay in the water column. Um, the algae paste is most likely not going to do that for you. Most of those cells probably all of them are dead, they're going to sink uh, to the bottom if given enough time um, and if you don't have enough uh, water flow going. Um, so there are some pros and there are some cons. Um, so I'll go through the pros first. Uh, the, the first pro is that you have consistency every single time. Um, much in the time when it much of the time when you're feeding live algae cultures, the quality and density of the algae culture available varies from day to day, and it becomes very difficult to provide uh, consistent uh, feedings um, unless you have a tremendous surplus in algae production, which is, is difficult to attain for large scale uh, production. Um, so, it's very nice to know that you are feeding 2 billion cells of all the species, Catastrophe mealeri, Tetrasalmus striata, 
TI crises. You're feeding all of these at 2 billion cells every single time. Um, and there's also a huge convenience from feeding from a bottle because not only you don't have to haul buckets or have feeding apparatus or, you know, you can just have a peristaltic pump and then make a, a algae solution and have, know that your, your shelf should be dosed a certain amount of cells, you know, every hour. Um, there's also techniques to use the algae paste to kind of enrich live algae. So kind of like a lipid emulsion where you're improving um, the fatty acid content and rough uh, cell density of your feed uh, tremendously um, while still having some of those live cells. Um, so those are some of the pros um, that really come out of that. It's, it's convenient. Um, there's a huge convenience um, when you have there. Now the cons uh, that you have, uh, one that I don't have here is that it's very expensive um, in that you know, you want to be somewhat liberal with how much you feed because it's very easy to overfeed and, uh, you know, this stuff is expensive per milliliter. So it's important to have a feeding strategy. Um, the second thing is that obviously you have non-viable cells, so they'll sink to the bottom and this will most likely promote bacterial growth. If you have a live algal cell, it's not decomposing readily. Uh, a bacteria has to be antagonistic or the cell has to die in order for decomposition to occur. Um, dead algae paste uh, will immediately you know, secrete their lipids. Those lipids will be oxidized and they will make uh, you know, nasty things. Um, so this makes um, algae paste really not appropriate for larvae, which are very sensitive to both bacterial loads, changes in water quality, and really could benefit from the probiotic um, effects of eating live microalgae. Um, so they're really probably not appropriate feed for larvae, but where algae paste really has a tremendous uh, utility for the modern oyster hatchery is that it can be used for feeding uh, and filling uh, broodstock and post set, which tremendously consume and hemorrhage algae assets in the hatchery. Um, the picture I have here is from a post set tank where oysters were rapidly consuming feed uh, from this relatively large culture tank. And whereas, you know, 4 million oyster larvae could be satiated for the day on, you know, a five gallon bucket of T. isocrises at 6 million cells per milliliter. Uh, this tank could take, you know, easily 60 gallons of algae culture a day and have it stripped by the afternoon. So to have um, a source of algae paste that can be easily used to darken this water and feed this set or to condition the broodstock successfully, um, uh, it would be extremely useful because that way you could save that premium live algal assets for uh, the larvae. Sorry, it's a typo there and not for the algae, uh, for, for the larvae. Um, so you would save the really good stuff for the larvae and then you would have this, this, this filler feed um, that you could use um, to keep your post set and your broodstock happy. And it has been demonstrated. I don't have a, a, a paper here though in, in my other literature, my other source I do. Um, there's a source here that the broodstock have been conditioned entirely on algae paste. Uh, their condition is not great afterwards, especially when compared to wild oysters, but they can be conditioned entirely on algae paste, uh, which really boosts the utility um, if you can keep your broodstock fed using this. So this paper is entitled Domestic Production of Algae Paste, and that's because there really isn't any domestic production, at least for the East Coast shellfish industry. Uh, most of the algae paste that is used in hatcheries around here on this coast are produced by the Reed Mariculture Corporation out of Campbell, uh, California. Um, they've been in business since the 90s, and they produce a wide range of algae concentrates for all kinds of different species. And they, they sell products across the world, the different hatcheries, research stations, aquariums. Um, you know, you, you'll see their name ubiquitous in your neighborhood pet store as much as you would in a shrimp hatchery, um, a higher-end one maybe in, in Bangkok or in Thailand or Southeast Asia. Um, so reed mariculture is highly successful both in being able to culture um, microalgae and being able to convert it into highly stable long-term um, paste uh, concentrates. Um, so one of the products in particular that we use a lot here in uh, the Noyan Catchery um, is the Shellfish Diet 1800. Um, so this is a combination of Pavlova, Tetracelmus, Isochryses, uh, Thalassoris Unona, Thalassoria Westphalgi, and Catosteris uh, diatoms. 
Um, so these guys are all mixed together at you know, 2 billion cells per milliliter. Um, and this is a, a highly effective product. Um, you know, again, uh, it can be overfed and can hurt larvae, but you know, if fed liberally, this can even feed larvae. This is this is premium stuff. Um, I don't have it right here, but you can buy this stuff for about thirty-seven dollars uh, per liter. Um, so this is um, not cheap, but you know, they they're 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 the most um, expansive on the market, the most widely available. You can go on on their website right now and order it and have it uh, shipped to you this week. Um, so this product is is really to, to kind of be admired in a way. But it is in California and most of the cost that any hatchery that's buying this product is going to pay is, is you know, at least a third of it's gonna be shipping. So the idea of just having a domestic um, source of algae paste closer to the hatcheries would be important because this stuff is highly perishable and shipping it across the United States um, doesn't make much sense to me um, when we it could be being produced here where it's being used in considerable um, amounts. Um, so as far as domestic algae paste production on the East Coast, uh, to my knowledge, uh, the only uh, burgeoning competitor to read Mariculture, at least in any semblance, is uh, Mook Sea Farms. Um, which in 2019 announced that they had been working on an algae paste product um, made of tetracelmus uh, cells. Um, so this, again, is very expensive at $100 a kilogram and is still kind of in its pilot stage. Obviously, the, the COVID-19 is probably going to suspend um, maybe the development of this. We'll see in the future. I'm sure this will be an antiquated uh, slide uh, in a few years as more hatcheries kind of undertake in the algae paste uh, product, but I thought MOOC should be of note as it is a highly successful hatchery that a lot of different um, farmers buy from. And obviously they have developed highly sophisticated methods of algae production to ensure the success of their hatchery. And they've reached a scale that they've decided to take those assets and figure out ways to preserve them and turn them into alternative products, which is going to be basically the, the end statement uh, in the mission of this kind of introductory uh, exploration into algae paste and uh, the future that it can and will have on the East Coast um, shellfish industry. Uh, this is a quick uh, view of current producers and distributors of algae paste. Um, most of them are overseas, um, though, again, the most relevant is the, the reed mariculture, um, which distributes through Pentair aquatic ecosystems. Um, I'd be hard pressed to find another product here that I would be comfortable spending the money on um, when I had had success with reed products, though, as you can see, there are no real domestic uh, East Coast manufacturers. So in conclusion, um, it's very important for the United States to improve its domestic seafood production in general. Um, if, if the COVID-19 chaos has taught us anything, it's that our nation cannot be dependent on Southeast Asia um, for its 90% of its seafood supply. It simply doesn't make sense with the coastline that we have. Um, thus, it's very important to start new mariculture industries, but also to encourage, expand, and fortify the ones that are existing, such as the Chrysostria virginica industry. Um, and the way to do that is through hatcheries. Uh, by having more hatcheries of a larger scale, uh, more of them, and in, in more places and locations through a, no other mechanism are you really going to be able to retain the genetics and have the kind of production that you want to have a mature uh, mariculture industry. Um, the main bottleneck for expanding these hatcheries is the food, um, the cost of, of food production. Um, and one of the mechanisms to help alleviate that and distribute and make effort more efficiency, more efficient and to increase in specialization would be to have this algae paste. 
Um, so for small scale hatcheries, you know, you might be limited in space or maybe you don't have someone specialized in algae production. So producing live microalgae, especially at any sort of scale, is difficult if not cost prohibitive for you. But perhaps if you were able to purchase algae paste at a reasonable enough cost, you would be able to handle your production um, without um, being dependent on large scale live microalgae supplies. Um, so that could benefit the small hatcheries tremendously by being able to purchase the stabilized products if they don't necessarily have the intellectual infrastructure to do it reliably on their own yet. Now, in the same at the same time, larger hatcheries, by contrast, that you know they have the skilled labor, they have the sanitary infrastructure that they've invested in. Um, you know, so instead of having a break every winter where maybe you experiment or try and improve your infrastructure, uh, it would be very desirable to keep that infrastructure running to keep producing algae year round. That way, you can convert that algae into paste, um, and you would be able to develop a surplus. So, you know, goodness forbid. Uh, something happens with your live microalgae production during uh, the, the the hatchery season, uh, you would then have this surplus paste that you could use to kind of uh, buffer buffer the blow until your live microalgae come back. And that could save a tremendous amount of investment in perhaps the, the season. Now, in regards, if there wasn't a calamitous event that cost you all your microalgae, uh, all of a sudden you have this huge surplus of paste, you could then sell that to smaller operators or to help uh, neutralize the cost of your live microalgae production. Um, so through these mechanisms, uh, paste can um, benefit um, small hatcheries where it just doesn't make sense to produce a lot of live microalgae or that you can't be reliable on your live microalgae, but at the same time it would benefit large-scale operations which are competent in producing live microalgae. And if they can achieve something towards the scale of reed mariculture, there's even perhaps uh, significant profits to be had that might exceed that of regular hatchery operations. Um, so it's a very uh, interesting um, development, I would say, in shellfish aquaculture because it will allow for more specialization in the future. Um, but right now, there, there are many bottlenecks um, with producing the algae in general, let alone with developing technology that would help refine uh, paste construction, make it more efficient, and make it last for longer periods. Though so once these bottlenecks are, are kind of circumvented, I really do believe in my heart of hearts that algae paste will become a valuable part of expanding and maturing the East Coast shellfish aquaculture.